intimate accommodations capture old world charm with a Spanish hacienda design and desert decor at La Quinta Resort and Club. The Diamond of the Desert offers championship golf on five resort courses. Spa La Quinta offers you serenity as you experience treatment under the desert sky. La Quinta Resort and Club is proud to be a sponsor of Hewell Hauser's Look at the Palm Springs area. Well, hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser, and here we are in beautiful Palm Springs. It's about, gosh, it's just 7.30 in the morning. We're yeah. up early this morning. We're really early. It's another beautiful day in the desert, and we are here today to do something that really is kind of the end thing to do now in Palm Springs, isn't it, Palm Jay? Palm Springs and all over California, and actually all over the country. This is one of the most rapidly growing tourism areas and uh, tourism thing to do right now, Eco, eco Jeep Tours. Eco Jeep Tours, and we'll get into what all of that means uh, as we progress during our adventure because Jay and I both agreed we want to get in that Jeep and we get want, out of town, don't we? We want to get out of town. Let's get out of the city, get into the desert, and find out what it's all about. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to have an honest-to-goodness desert adventure. This is an eco tour, and we'll find out more about what all that's about as we get in the Jeep and head out into the desert. Let's go. Let's go. Now, Jay, I guess you've seen this area change a lot over the years, haven't you? Sure have. I've been here 43 years. I arrived in July of 1956 with 114 degrees, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know where I was. And at that point in time, there was two stop signals in the entire valley, one at the uh, north end of Palm Springs, and the other one at the east end where uh, Indio and uh, old Highway 6070 would turn off and go up the hill towards uh, Phoenix. That Wait was a minute, there were two stoplights in town in 1958? 56. 56? Two stoplights. Oh my gosh. Now we've got from our office to uh, La Quinta, we probably now got about 56 just on that stretch of highway alone. Well, that's progress. Everybody wants to come to the desert, but when they get here, especially as tourists, they want to get out and see the desert, don't they? And we're going to see it. Yes, it is. And uh, we're going to see the desert in the, the best of times, and then right now in uh, starting to get the worst of times. What do you mean? Because the wind coming through right now, there's it's no accident that our cities were built over close to the mountains on the uh, south edge of this valley. Because if you look, the mountains coming through the pass over there act like a venturi and just funnel this wind through. Well, that's where they have the wind farms over there. The big wind farm out there that uh, about 3,500 windmills out there. But the wind really is part of the desert, isn't it? I mean that comes with the territory. Every bit of part of the desert is the, uh, the sun, the heat, the sand, and even the rain, or lack thereof. Now, we're in, a, we're in an open area now. You're taking your hat off, aren't you? No, I can't keep it on. You're just giving up on it. <laughs> we're this, in an open area now. Yeah, this is uh, pristine desert land. It's never been uh, cultivated. It's never really been watered. That's what this valley would have looked like if you had been on this tour 400 years ago and come across there in a covered wagon. That's what you would come across. Well, now, wait a minute. This is what this desert would have looked like exactly 100 years ago or 50 years ago almost. Well, much of this desert looked like this uh, 43 years ago. Yeah. Because the area over there with the uh, big Marriott Desert Springs with a sand dune pile when I first got here, we used to drive old pickup trucks and uh, other Jeeps up and down those sand dunes over there. Boy, we're in a sandstorm here. Can you feel that? You feel the little grains hitting your side of your face. Well, it's getting in my contact lenses. That's the problem. <laughs> That'll be a problem, right. But uh, before the development started, the big sandstorm would come through here and you could just strip the paint off of cars. Look over here. You can hardly see the mountains for the for the sand blowing. That's what this whole desert's all about. And uh, the mountains back there, just blasting this sand through it, constricts that wind and makes it boil up through here. That boiling effect will pick up the wind, pick up the sand, and just rake it through this desert. 
Well, it's probably still not very good on cars, is it? Not very good on cars or any or anything else, really, as you can feel it hitting the side of our cheek going through. Oh, my God. Over on your right, there's a remnants of an old uh, cabin that was a homesteader's cabin. Up until about 1958, this was still homesteadable land. Now, what do you mean, homesteadable? Well, it was government land, and people could come in and uh, mark off two and a half acres, put some uh, a cabin or some improvements on the land, and after five years, it became theirs. Well, there's a parcel of 35 acres for sale. What do you think that'd go for now? It's hard to tell in this area. I'm not sure where the water is. Well, I noticed it's too windy out here to build anything out <laughs> in this windy part of the desert, isn't it? Well, that's what we used to think uh, 30 years ago. We wouldn't buy out there. That's the wind belt. We don't want to go out there because the sand blows. But now, as the cities encroach coming off of the north slope of the Santa Rosa Mountains and encroach this way, they're filling up. They need more land, and they're moving out into what we used to call the sand belt. Because the city of Palm Springs and Palm Desert and Rancho Mirage and Cathedral City they're all nestled up under these mountains right here, aren't That's they? That's right. They're, you can look over. This is Palm Desert right here in front of us off to our uh, left. And you can see it's, it's tucked back in there, what's known as Deep Canyon. Actually, that's just the alluvial fan coming out from uh, those mountains. And all of our uh, cities, the early pioneers weren't stupid. Uh, they come through here, and they could see this, uh, the desert the way it laid. And they tucked their developments back in these little canyons to do two things. They took advantage of uh, the wind shadow coming down through the center of the valley. It's only when we get real hard winds that they'll get any wind up there at all. And as the sun goes across the sky and sets in the west, they get the shade first. And so it can, up until about July or August, when all the rocks get hot and everything just stays hot, uh, they're one of the shadiest and the coolest areas. Now we have pulled over to the side of the road because Jay is pointing out to us, and boy, you're doing it in a very dramatic way, what the desert used to look like. Because Jay, this is what the desert looks like today in, in these cities. Yeah, they found open desert, flat land, good water. They come in and sprinkle a little money on it, nurture that a little bit, and up pops condominiums and golf courses. Right, that's the developed desert. And right across the street, now this is the way it all used to look. And boy, I mean to tell you, this is just sand. It is almost as fine or finer than most beach sands. And as we are, we're, we're at uh, sea bottom here. This is primeval. What do you mean sea bottom? We were an ancient sea back uh, a couple of million years ago. And we've been a lake bottom more than once also. And we'll see that as we get a little bit further down. So all of this came from the bottom of a sea. That's it. That's why it looks like. It's just like beach sand. That's yeah. what we're in. We're at the bottom of an ocean here. Now, if we come back here in a couple of years, is this? Going to look like this? Most likely, uh, they'll come. Somebody will come in with some uh, deep pockets, spread some money over there, and uh, this stuff will grow. We found early on in the desert we can grow just about anything there is. Uh, we have agriculture. We'll go through as long as you put a little water on it, a little money in it. Hello. Anything will grow. You equate water and money. It's the same thing. Absolutely, isn't it? just about. <laughs> well, on this desert, it is. Here it is. There's the new desert over here. Here's the old desert over here. And all we need is a little money to sprinkle on it. It's going to blossom. It'll blossom quite, uh, quite well. All right, let's get back in our red Jeep. You've nicknamed it the Rattler. This is Rattler. We're getting back in Rattler, and we're taking off. This is fun. <laughs> Sprinkling money. <laughs> Now, what's this area? This is the uh, lower end of Bermuda Dunes as it uh, comes into where Indio is. And oh, there really down. are dunes all around these here. Look at this. Dunes. And I like to point out these dunes coming up on our front. Uh, this is the edge of ancient Lake Kauia that uh, we'll see a little bit later. The actual water line came right up to uh, this street. It's Jefferson Street. And Indians used to encamp right there on those uh, dunes, right in that hollow as we go through. 
uh, was an Indian encampment. And before this development was done over here, the Heritage Palms, they had to do an archaeological survey over this whole area. Right in that little hollow is where the Indians uh, used to camp. The mesquite on these dunes was once very prevalent throughout the uh, desert floor itself. Uh, one of the principal food sources for the Kauai Indian that uh, lived here prior to uh, European contact, of course. And now you see signs on both sides of the road. There are the flags. It's all been, oh, look, see, look, that's like a green golf course that's, over there. That is a golf course over there. We've got about 100 golf courses, uh, fully 18-hole championship-style golf courses on the desert. And here's another interesting dichotomy because you've got your sand yeah, dunes over, over here are the right. sand dunes and on the other side is a golf course oh my gosh look at that more money more water we can grow anything now jay we've stopped here because you said this is a real example of the evolving history of this area right we're in uh, la quinta about 15 miles east of palm springs Palm in Street. an old uh, orange grove. Old, old citrus grove. This is actually uh, grapefruit and tangerines. And uh, as the tourism moves more and more to the east, the uh, farmer, rather than uh, pulling these old trees out, recycling them and putting new trees in and waiting uh, to be productive again, is selling it off to developers who are coming in uh, sprinkling some money around and uh, developing it into condominiums and golf courses. And agriculture is being pushed further and further to the east. So traditionally, Palm Springs was the tourist area. Everything east of that was the citrus, the agriculture area. How old would you say this? Well, I just picked this. I guess it's OK. Is this, is this in use now? That's probably not in productive use, but I see the water's running. And we've got blossoms on the, uh, on the trees. That would be a good grapefruit. And what's probably going to happen is they're going to maintain some of these trees, waiting to put houses in, use them as landscaping uh, in their uh, development, just very similar to what the citrus is doing over here. Yeah, now look, this is what's really interesting. They've, this is the new development that's going in, and it's called citrus. This is the citrus of a La Quinta. Actually, it's the back part of uh, Rancho La Quinta. And that's where the Skins game was uh, last year. But they've taken an old date grove, and many of our developers have done the same thing, have hollowed it out, keeping some of the old trees and then uh, using those as landscaping. This was actually a productive date grove about uh, 15, 20 years ago. Look at this. I never thought about this. This was a date grove. They're still in production. You can, this tree here has still got some flowers coming off. And if they get pollinated, they'll still grow dates. So they're playing off the agricultural history by keeping some of the date palms. They're keeping the, the name, the citrus. There's the old grove down there. Uh, agriculture is moving out and... Tourism is moving in. Tourism and development is moving in. But it's moving, but it's still being replaced south. Yeah, because this is still a rich agricultural area. The farmer would take the profit he makes out of his uh, land here and buy cheaper land down there and reestablish it and reestablish his groves uh, with that money. Yeah. Look, it's wide open out here, but development is moving in. Development is moving in. Now this, I've never seen anything like this. You pulled over <laughs> to the side of the road. There he is out there mowing the newest crop here in the desert. Tell us what this is. Well, for the golfers in it, this is, I like to call this a divot farm. But uh -huh. in reality, this is a turf farm. And it's a new agricultural crop that uh, we've been growing here now for about eight or nine years. And uh, they grow it for landscaping purposes. Uh, this is grass. That's all it is, is grass. They'll it take it out. It's like one huge golf course green, doesn't it? It does. It really does. I mean, this is beautiful. This is top drawer grass. West Coast Turf is probably one of our premier grass growers in the country. And they have several acres down here. And that's what we're walking on. They got an implement that'll come down and cut it down for about an inch, inch and a half. Roll it up like a big piece of carpet. 
take it out to a prepared ground and uh, tack it down with a little water and there you got it, instant lawn. This is absolutely, I have never, I guess I never thought about how they would grow turf, but this is just spectacular out here. This is a pretty one, this is a pretty field. A turf farm. Turf farm. And uh, if people watching the uh, Super Bowl, whenever the Super Bowl is played on a natural grass stadium, west of the Rio Grande, generally that will be grown on turf supplied from right here in the Coachella Valley by West Coast Turf. Boy, I tell you, everything out here in the desert, that's why I love the desert so much, everything out here is on a huge scale, because look right over here at the mountains. Mountains, that's uh, Mount Santa Rosa up there, and the, uh, the foothills to it, Santa Rosa Mountains. Just has a good feel to it out here. I love it, I've been in the desert 43 years, I think I'll stay. <laughs> the uh, early uh, Spanish pioneers that came through there named this area La Palma de los Manos de Dios, which means the palm of God's hand. And if you look at it from above, it just looks like the palm of your hand with the mountains all around it and the valley right down between it. Yeah. And it's just one of the most spectacular places. People spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to come here, and I get the privilege of living here, and I love it. Well, they grow all kinds of things here in the Coachella Valley. We have now stopped in a palm tree farm. Right. We got about 60 acres of uh, fan palms over there that's being grown for landscaping purposes. So they'll be taking these palm trees all over California, all over the valley, all over the world. Could be. Uh, they, they grow them in various sizes. They've got the larger sizes and the smaller ones. Uh -huh. uh, they charge so much a foot, but then uh, that's what it's for, landscaping purposes. And we've now, got... I find this interesting because Traditionally, historically, there were no palm trees out here except just a few in the oasis. In and around the oasis was the uh, original uh, indigenous tree, the Washingtonia flipper, or the California fan palm, uh, was located only in the free water oases around the valley. And everything else has been grown on farms like this or brought in from somewhere right. else. Particularly this one. That's a date palm. And what we have on the ground here are cuttings from the date palm that they are pruning out, thinning uh, the overall dates. Uh huh. And that is a date, those are date strings. So wait a minute, these are dates that just haven't those developed will be yet? Dates. Wow. And the date palm was not indigenous to no. the desert? No, they're not. They were brought in for commercial purposes right around the early part of the 20th century. From where? From uh, Algiers and Morocco and Iraq. You're From the kidding. Middle East. Brought in here various varieties to see which ones would grow. And they found that nearly all varieties would grow because our climate is almost exactly like that of the Middle East. So none of these date palms were here? No. Not even in the oasis in the old days, obviously. I mean, when the, you know, the oasis out in the deserts didn't have date palms. No date here. palms. No, they had the uh, fan palm, but not the date palm. <sighs> no wind. Everything has settled down. It's nice and quiet, warm. That's as pretty a shot right there as you're going to find anywhere. That is pretty. They're propagating new uh, citrus out there. Wait a minute. Where? Right there, that field. That's, That's citrus. Those are citrus right. trees? They don't propagate citrus by planting seeds. They actually take a cutting, and all the citrus is uh, a cutting and planted on lemon rootstock, because the lemon rootstock is the strongest, and all the other citrus grows from that. Boy, we're getting an agricultural tour here today, but this is not why we stopped. No. We stopped here to see this, and boy, it is dramatic, Louie, when you look up here. Tell us what we're seeing, Well, Jay. if you look at the dark rocks, and you see where they meet against the lighter color rocks, and if you follow your eye all the way through, you can see a nice straight line. Really, only one thing in nature that creates a straight line like that is water. And that's exactly what it looks like. That's an ancient water line, the high water mark of ancient Lake Kauia that was here about four or 500 years ago. Had you been here at that point, we would be under about 60 feet of water. Really? Yeah. And that was here as recently as 500 years ago. Right. It dried up and 
Not all the scientific papers uh, agree, but about 1590 is when uh, this lake finally uh, receded and dried up. Let me show you. Let me go across the street. Let me show you something. Where are you taking us? Well, I'm going to try to find a good spot for my shells. You moved me so that... Here we go. Once I point them out, they're easy to see. Ah, I see what you're doing. You're collecting evidence of that ancient sea. That ancient lake bottom. And there they are, right there. What are those little, uh, they're little shells. Those well, little shells, those are little uh, snail shells. These are freshwater shells. About the same thing that you would have in your aquarium today. And this one, this whole area was once just littered uh, with those shells. The valley was originally was supposed to be called the La Conchita Valley. La Conchita in Spanish means little shell. Ah. Where Coachella came from, we don't have a clue. <laughs> well, this, this gives a perfect example of the diversity and the wonder of where we are, because in this one little three minute stop we made, we saw the palm tree farm. We learned about the date palms not being native to this area at all. We saw citrus being grown. We saw the water line and the little shells, little shells of the ancient lake. It's all right here. All in a five minute stop. We could do an hour program standing right here. <laughs> What's over here on the left? These are table grapes. 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 Uh, we'll, we grow an awful lot of table grapes here. Our client. Our climate or our soils are not good for wine grapes, but they're just right for table grapes. And look at it in relationship. There's the old date grove right over there. We'll see a lot more grapes as we uh, go on through into Mystery Canyon. Grapes in relationship to dates. Dates and citrus. Now, is this grove still producing? It's still producing. It's an old grove. That will probably come out. We've got a brand new grove over here. On Look the right. over here, Louie, on the right. This is a new grove of, of date palms. Date palms. Can you make money growing dates? I guess you can. I guess they do. They sure grow a lot of them. We grow 95% of the dates grown in the United States are grown right here. Look, here's another one over here on the left. These are very old uh, palms. They've probably been in there 50, 60 years. A date is a very labor intensive product and that each one of those uh, palms will have to be climbed about uh, 40 or 50 times during the growing uh, year. Now this is a good little date grove here we can stop and it looks like there's some trees out there. We can go out and get some of those dates that have been left on there by the picking. So we're see what gonna they actually taste like. pick a date. Let's go pick a date. Boy, here comes the wind again. Yeah, we're going across that uh, valley. We get tucked back down in the canyon, we'll be out of it again. Oh, there are the dates. Yeah, they're hanging right here. Now, see, I wouldn't think a tree this young would have dates on it. Well, these are starting their productive, uh, productive runs. Boy, look and, at the uh, wind out here, Louie. Right this is amazing. It's there. blowing, and it's full of dust. There's a, there's a decent, a uh, couple of decent dates right here. You'll. Here's a fresh date right off the tree. There's no insecticide needed on dates, so that powder is a little bit of dust and a little natural yeast that's on there, but they're very edible. Is there a, a seed in here? Is there, there a seed in there, yeah. Oh, boy. Na nature's candy. Man. Satisfy a sweet tooth every bit as much as a Snickers bar. I have one more of those. About 10 times better for you. And is it okay for us to be eating this guy's dates? Well. He's left them on, and we got the flowers coming out, getting ready for the new productive run. So, boy, these are good. They look so hanging there. They don't look that attractive. But be careful of these thorns. Oh, boy. Dates are armored. Wow. And look at this. The wind and the dust and all of this. This is really points up the physicality of the desert, the, the, the way nature is always in control. That's right. 
we've moved out from behind the mountains where it was nice and calm, right down through the middle of the desert, and we're getting into that wind tunnel, picking up this fine dust and sand that we use as soil, and throwing it around a little bit. Boy, I tell you what, if we stay here much longer, <laughs> I'm gonna pick this tree dry. But they're good. Wonder Those, if we could take a whole thing of them. It'll really spoil your lunch, I'll tell you. Here. Can we take a whole? Yeah. Got it? Yeah. That's our lunch right there. That could be lunch. You <laughs> know, the Persian army conquered half the world with dates. What do you mean? Well, dates give you just about everything you need, vitamins and minerals, but no protein. So with uh, dates on the camel's backs and a herd of goats, goats, milk for the protein, conquer the world. Well, we're not trying to conquer the world. We're just trying to conquer our little part of the desert right here today on our eco tour desert adventure. And the adventure continues. Let's get to the canyon, get out of this wind. Now we have gotten out of the agricultural area. I guess they're not growing anything up here yet. They will someday. Maybe I'm someday, sure. but right now it's uh, this is raw prime desert land. Well, why did you bring us here? This is one of you said one of your most popular stops on your tour. Right. Now we're going over in this area right here that looks like the surface of the moon. And really I don't want to tell you about it until we actually get there. Boy, it does have a very surreal look to it. This is a, it? What we're walking across right here is a desert wash. And uh, we've got uh, a lot of things happening right here in this particular canyon. That's why I wanted you to come down here. And Boy, we'll get up look this at spot. this. I have no idea where you're... Uh, stick with me. Trust me. Trust me. I don't work for the government. <laughs> and Huel, this is it. This is why I drug you all the way from your nice, comfortable home this morning <laughs> to look at this piece of bar coming out of the ground here. What in the world now, is this? Caltech knows very well what that is because we are standing on the San Andreas Fault. Oh my gosh. The San Andreas Fault, at this point, it's about 200 yards wide. It's not just one crack in the ground. It's covered over by all the surface alluvium. Now, so this is what- This the... stuff back here is known as fault gouge. This fault is gouge. Fault gouge or gray wick. It's pulverized ground up rock that has been pushed up by the action of the two plates grinding past one another and grinding up the underlying rock and pushing it up to the surface and out of the surface. Oh my gosh, this looks violent. You can do the same thing with a, by taking an Oreo cookie, squeeze it together and run the sides past and the cream comes out the top. Yeah. That's the same action that's causing these to be eroded here. You take a handful of it, you can see that it is very fine powder. Sand. It's even finer than the sand we saw earlier today. So it was just ground up it's when it was pushed up, up out rock. of the... It's almost like talcum powder. When was this pushed up? It's No, not when, is. We always talk geology in present tense because it's an ongoing process happening right now in various events. And it gets worn away, of course, by uh, sun, wind, and rain, a process of erosion. What are these things? I don't have a clue. <laughs> you mean I found something you don't know I don't the have answer a, to? no idea what that's. It looks like the end of an axle. Why it's there, I have no idea. Wow. Well, they're not going anywhere, that's for sure. They may be some kind of primitive measuring device. Boy, you know, they could film movies back up in here. They have in uh, some of the canyons that we're going. Uh, both uh, Star Trek and uh, some of the Star Wars sequences in this Look area. Look at this. Let's go up here. This is a good spot. This is amazing. And all of this was pushed up by earthquakes. Well, not necessarily earthquakes, but just the fault movement. We're at the, the meeting of two major plates on our Earth. The Pacific Plate, which is over on that side, where Palm Springs and Southern California is, and the Continental Plate, which oh, is over here to our left. And where gosh. they come together is the San Andreas Fault in California. Look at this. And this is fault gouge. That's brown up there. That mountain is that's, brown. That's got a lot of iron in it. 
You know, the last time I felt like this was standing in Death Valley. It has that same stark Well, our look valley to and it. Death Valley were created about the same way at about the same time. Really, the only difference between us is we have water and they don't. Yeah. And to think that all of this is just this, this real fine clay. It's not rock at all. It's pulverized rock brought upon by the action of the San Andreas. And the two major plates over on that side is the Pacific Plate. And over on this side is the Continental Plate. And where they meet the... in the middle is the San Andreas. Those plates are grinding past one another, grinding up that underlying rock and pushing it up to the surface. Now there's more, right? There's much more. Oh, gosh. This is just the beginning. Boy, this is, I've never seen anything like this before. Well, this is an unusual area. We've got two major forces of the Earth at work right around us as we're driving through right now. We have the uplifting and the surface rupture of the uh, plates coming together. Uh, at the San Andreas Fault, when they crash together, that tremendous pressure is pushing uh, these mountains or ridges up, disrupting the normal flow of things. Boy, I bet geology classes like to come out here, don't they? We've got about 15 different uh, universities that use this as a geology textbook. And is this part of a, na this should be part of a national park or something. This is, is this should be preserved. It is protected now. It is part of the uh, Desert Preservation Act of 1992 and it's administered by the Bureau of Land Management. And so this uh, is all protected? It is protected now. Now, on the left right over here, not many people see a wave in a rock. Yeah. And as you can see, the wave right Look there in the rock. Right over to your right, it just goes right down a little bit more. That's wow. Called, that's called a syncline anticline structure. The upside is the syncline, the downside is the anticline, and the bottom is the graben. That's the Earth's mountain building process. That's really what's going on in our valley over there with the uplifting of the Santa Rosas and San Jacinto Mountains and the depression or the pushing down of the uh, Coachella Valley. Well, I didn't know we were going to be getting a geology tour, too. Well, that's what part of this is, is a lot of agriculture and geology. Let me move up here just a little bit, and I'm going to show you another interesting dichotomy here. Okay. That the uh, geologists call a non-conforming ridge line and that's that's right through here you notice at this point right here we got the coming together of two very different materials on the left is conglomerate sandstone uh, i think that's called the the mecca formation i'm not going to use those technical terms i don't understand them and on the right is a different material called bracia and uh, you can see the difference now the sandstone is younger than the bracia bracia has got a lot of iron in it, that's why it's red. So for this quarter of a mile, really what we have to do is pick this ridge up, turn it 90 degrees and put it back down in the earth, because yeah. that's the way it was originally laid down. Yeah. Not side by side, but with the earth action out there and the San Andreas coming in, uh, Mother Nature decided that uh, we're going to turn things around a little bit. Well, this was worth the trip in itself. This is magnificent. Look at the size of this place. Yeah, this is just the beginning of our uh, Mystery Canyon area as we get back through in, in the inside. This is a wide spot. Where do we get into the small crack? <laughs> so this is part of the tour. Yeah, this is part of our tour. Boy, this is amazing. It shows you what the uh, forces of a little bit of water can do because uh, this is created by erosion, erosion by water. And so many, there was water rushing through all of this. At times there is. Still? Still. This is continuing. This is a continuum. This is not something that has happened. This is something that is happening. Well, no water today. Hopefully not. And we, from a look at the sky, no prospects of water. We don't come back in here when it's raining. I bet. It seems ironic when you come to the desert and I talk about uh, our rainfall of being uh, four to five inches a year, whether we need it or not. And then almost the second thing out of my mouth, I talk about floods and water. Yeah. And uh, we got to put it in perspective. Boy, this is just, I mean, you just wouldn't expect any of this. And here it is, 
Well, just rising up. Look at this. Look at the size of this, the way it just cuts across here. I want to touch this and see what it feels like. Is it hard? Is it soft? You'll feel that it's just about like concrete. It's very, very hard. But it's because not rock. It's sandstone. It's rock now because it's been, these pieces have been brought down by the water. The natural cements within the soil itself with the pressure and the water coming through actually cements it in and it's a natural concrete. Boy, yeah. when you walk through here, look at this. Don't look up as you go through there. That's what I always tell people. Of course, that's exactly what I want them to do. That rock right there that you're pointing to, that's a poison rock. What do you mean a poison? One drop will kill you. <laughs> oh gosh. And here come the here comes another the tour. Survivors, yeah. Well, we're, well a... we're hiking back. What is there to see back there? <laughs> Oh, it's great back there. Wait until you see the rocks. Really? Yeah, it's beautiful. Here comes a lady who's huffing and puffing. Well, you get to crawl under rocks, and you oh. get to squish through places where people my size don't fit very well. <laughs> well, is it worth the trip back yes. there? Yes, yes, it was worth it. Now, Jay, I thought you'd be giving the tour guide spiel here. Well, we've got to work a little bit first, because we've got to get up over these rocks and get back down in this little crack on the other side. But, so uh, really, when you're giving tours, people are just busy walking. And sometimes the rocks have to speak for themselves. Yeah. And other times, i got to watch the trail and be sure that everybody's safe. Yeah, because this is kind of a, boy, this is just, oh, look. Look at this. Now, be careful here. You just use these just like steps, going right down into this step. Oh, my gosh. We're going into a little washout area through a little narrow place. And if you look at the side here, you can actually see the water course coming through. I call this a petrified stream. We're gonna go back, we're going through here. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> Is this Mystery Canyon? Well, it's not a mystery anymore because we're here now. Boy, this is something back. Look at this rock just kind of perched. Yeah. Now, how safe is this? Well, it's reasonably safe. We've been here at least the three years that I've been working here. It's probably come down in the last century or so. But as long as it's not raining, we're okay. Don't set up any low pitch hums going through to set up any vibration in these rocks. Shh. Shh. Don't make any noise. We don't want to disturb the rock. Now this is a tight fit. This is not a tour for city slickers. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is created by water. If you look at the side, as we go through, you can see, almost see the uh, stream bed coming through, these little pebbles sticking out. So water was rushing water through Water rushes here. through here and is eating this thing out. As I kind of call this a uh, petrified stream. Boy, this is, boy, this is, like I said, this isn't a city slicker tour. This is not a city slicker tour, although we bring a lot of city slickers back here and they enjoy it a lot. Yeah, because you know what? They're not expecting to see anything like this in the desert, are they? And we don't tell them until they get here. Yeah. That's why it's Mystery Canyon. We keep it a mystery until we get here. Then they get inside these little cracks and they understand. And what do you do with people who can't make it through there? We've never. How do you delicately put that to them? We really never have a uh, problem getting people in. What we say at the beginning, if you have claustrophobia or something, we're going to go in a tight spot. We can always see the sky, and that usually um, placates most of them. And if it ever gets to be beyond your ability, just sit down by a rock, because we're coming back out the same way we came in. Yeah. And we're no more than 10 or 15 minutes away from you at any one time. Well, this has definitely been worth the hike. In the desert, here we are in Mystery Canyon.
and a beautiful one it is. And this is a part of a desert that was created by water. Well, Jay, this has been quite a day. We have seen a little bit of everything out here in the desert, and I think we're ending it up uh, very appropriately in front of another very strange yet wonderful part of the desert. Just shows you the complete diversity of this desert. We're standing in the middle of a catfish farm. A catfish farm in the desert. Now, when did they figure out they could grow catfish out here? Well, we've been growing catfish for about 20 years that I'm aware of. We also have striped bass growing and uh, we also have some aquatic plant areas. All this is happening in the middle of our desert. We get five and a half inches of rain a year. This is amazing. And I tell you what, you call this a uh, Jeep Eco Tour desert adventure and that's exactly, when you talk about eco, you're not just talking about nature, you're talking about nature in all her forms and also the way she interacts with humans. Right, eco is short for ecology and to me ecology is everything that you see around us and everything that we've done uh, to our environment and with our environment or in spite of it if you will. Good and bad. Good and bad. Well when you take people on the tour I bet you there are a lot of people not only people from out of town but I bet you uh, out of state, I bet you most Californians don't know all these aspects to the desert. Huel, there's a lot of people living right here in this desert that don't know this, all the aspects of what they have. Yeah, because what have we seen today? Well, we've seen <laughs> agriculture, we've seen dates, we've seen golf courses, condominiums, raw desert land, catfish farms, uh, the San Andreas fault, fault gouge, and the little crack that we walked through, all part of our desert. Yeah. Well, it's a strange and wonderful, it's a very physical place, and yet it's a very spiritual place. And really, you're never surprised at what you might find in the desert. I mean, this, a catfish farm doesn't surprise me a bit. <laughs> and it shouldn't. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, still other diversities here that we haven't even explored yet. Yeah. Well, that's another day and another tour. Thank you very, very much. This has been a wonderful day that's really just given us, I think, a, a real broad idea of just how diverse and wonderful the desert really is. It's all here for us to enjoy. We just have to take the time to slow down and open up our eyes and, and, and see it. Look and see and hopefully uh, create those changes that are better for both us and the economy yeah. and the ecology. And the economy. And the economy, too. It's all yeah. in there together. It's all part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Huel. This Enjoy has been it. a wonderful day in the desert. Now let's go fish for some catfish. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if we can get some out of there. <laughs> you love this desert, don't you? I really do. I've been in this desert for all my adult life. And I used to even work for a living. But now I give that up, and I can come out and have fun. and. I guess one of the, the best things of it is just showing people uh, why I love it and what I love about the desert. Well, you're turning people on to the desert. They don't know this is out here. Well, I hope so, because I got turned on by it at an early age and decided to stay. Brought my wife out here in 1965 from Pennsylvania. She's decided she's going to stay, too. And uh, together, we've made a good life, and we've had a good life out here, and uh, just enjoy it immensely. Well, the desert has a lot to offer. It certainly does. And uh, many people come to the desert and they stay for a little while and they say, we don't like it because there's no change of seasons. That's only because they haven't seen it to know when the seasons are changing because our seasons in the desert are very subtle changes. The wind is all part of it. Or they, or they just think it's a hot, dry place. Hot, dry, formidable place that uh, no one could possibly live there, and yet uh, we have such diversity and uh, such an interesting place to live that people spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to come here uh, during the good times as well as the bad, and uh, I, get a, I get the privilege of living here. Well, there's a lot more to see than just downtown Palm Springs, the resort hotels and all of that. That's good, but there's a lot right out of town too. 
Absolutely. We're not more than uh, 20 miles from downtown Palm Springs at this point in time. And we're in the middle of agriculture. And where we were was not more than like 25 miles away. We're right in the middle of a very intense geological area. We're passing through about 75,000 acres of agriculture. We have the Salton Sea down there, which is 230 feet below sea level. There are just a great things to see and do all over this, uh, this valley. A dry, sun-baked plain lying at the foot of towering mountains. Geologists tell us that millions of years ago, it was the bottom of an ancient sea. Yet today, it's a waterless wasteland across which a modern highway threads its way from the lush coastal valleys of California to an equally lush oasis in this barrenness. Palm Springs, California, where Blessing and I spent our Christmas holidays, a modern little winter resort city that came to be known as the playground of the stars. It seems incredible that a little more than 30 years ago, this tiny village had few accommodations for visitors. Today, there are more than 300 hotels, rainurious to modest, to meet the requirements of the quarter of a million winter sun worshipers who visit Palm Springs each season. These fine hotels are one of the principal reasons for Palm Springs becoming a leading convention city of the West. Between Columbus Day and Easter, hardly a week passes without some convention of businessmen or civic leaders meeting in America's desert oasis. We chose the Desert Inn for our stay, mostly because it is the outgrowth of the first real guest house in Palm Springs, and we thought it would be a good place to learn the history of the town. So after checking in, we went to the pool terrace for lunch and to plan a sightseeing drive. Blessing made friends with Gino, who lives in Palm Springs, and she showed us where to drive to see most of the town. You can see how well planned and attractive the little city is. Each turn of the road showed us either a beautiful home or a well-designed building. Several trailer parks have been built recently. One owned by Bing Crosby and luxurious homes on wheels are a common sight in Palm Springs today. And then as we passed one home, we spotted a familiar face. Hoagie Carmichael, off to the golf course with his son and a neighbor lad. The newcomer to Palm Springs is invariably surprised at the shopping center, as modern and beautiful as any in the country. Here you find branches of some of the most famous stores in America, as well as unique and exotic little specialty shops of all kinds. Center, a shopping center you could find only in Palm Springs. There are four beautiful golf courses in the Palm Springs area, which might be the reason it is becoming the winter golf capital of America, and probably one reason the president chooses Palm Springs for his winter vacation. I also wound up looking forward to a charcoal broiled dinner at one of the many top-notch restaurant nightclubs in Palm Springs. It's difficult to choose a place for dinner. They're all so exceptional, 
and several of them have shows featuring top ranking stars. But when we spotted Louis Armstrong's name on the Chi-Chi marquee, that was it. Early next morning, we started out on a drive to the date grove, stopping outside of town to hike up rugged Tokwitz Canyon. In the warmth of the desert sun, it was hard to remember that we were spending Christmas in Palm Springs. Well, Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley is definitely a place of contrast because we have just left the wonderful natural Indian canyons and we've come into Palm Springs itself, into downtown Palm Springs. There's Indian Canyon Drive right over there. We're right now on Palm Canyon Drive, which is the main drag in Palm Springs. We're outside Starbucks. Louie and I stopped by here to get our morning fix of coffee. Now stand up, because you got a story to tell. <laughs> this lady accosted us at the coffee counter. You came Hi. over and said what? I said, hi, Mr. Hauser. My name's <laughs> Leslie Place. And I said, are you a local? Yeah, I am. I tell am. us your story. Well, it's like. No big deal. I moved here from Northern California about 11, 12 years ago. And what did you think when you moved here? Oh my God. When I moved here, I thought I have just made the largest mistake of my life. Why? Because it's this totally is paradise. Different. It wasn't paradise when I landed. I landed from San Francisco International. It was foggy. I'm wearing black sweats and I landed in Ontario Airport. Everything's brown. I thought, where's the trees? Where's the green? I'm like, oh my God. And it took me about two years, but um, I would never move. I love it here. I love it here. Well, we're not working for the Chamber of Commerce no, yet, no, no. but what is it about Palm Springs that has so captivated you besides your boyfriend over <laughs> here who should stand up and <laughs> yeah, get in this shot too? Because he saw you first. <laughs> and you sent her in to do the dirty work. I did. I said, that's Yul Hauser. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us what it is about Palm Springs that has mm. so captivated you. It's a little bit slower. I mean, the Bay Area is huge now. It's totally crowded. There's not as much traffic here, but like you can come down to downtown Palm Springs, sit out like on a Saturday morning, which I love to do. I'm always trying to drag him out here and sit back and just watch everybody go by. Saturday, we are out here last night. And it, I mean, there was tons of people, tons of stuff going on. Yeah. I just love it. Do you hike up in the canyons? We just came from one of the Indian canyons. It's we spectacular. We haven't gone there, but we're going to the tram today. Ah. So we're going to get our coffee first to get a little energy, and we're going to go up there and spend the day. Now, are you a local? I've been here four years. So you're really new in I'm new really in new. Town. I'm starting to get used to it. She won you over. Something like that. <laughs> No, I don't mean personally. I just mean <laughs> to Palm Springs. No, I'm sorry. I, I, we do this almost every uh, Saturday morning. Yeah. Come out here and people watch and walk around. And last night, you know, we went to dinner at Muriel's. It's a really nice hot spot. It's almost like being in L.A. It's, yeah. it's fun, but it's a little quiet. You don't get the traffic. And you've got this natural beauty, these mountains and the trees oh, and everything all around you. In the wintertime when it's clear, I mean, the sky is like much more turquoise. You see the mountains, you see the snow. It's you like see the stars. Oh, God, it's so beautiful. Desert hot springs. I used to live out there first and the stars are so clear. It's see, just I have gorgeous. a house up in 29 Palms. Yeah. Have you ever been up there? Yeah, I have. Joshua Tree yeah. National Park. Yeah. The stars are really, really bright clear. up there. It's just gorgeous, you know? I, I, I can't imagine living anywhere else. It's open. Now we, have a little, we have a little noise pollution every once in yeah. a while, those motorcycles going by. But you know what? It keeps it exciting. There's yeah. so many different people coming into town all the time. It's just wonderful. Well, nice to meet you. Nice Your name is? Nice to meet you too, Leslie Place. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My name's Guy. Thank you all for allowing us to have you on the air. Your check is in the mail. Here <laughs> comes you. a guy right here. Howdy. Well, howdy. I'm Huel Hauser. Yeah, I could have told you that. <laughs> well, <laughs> what are you? What is this all about? This is the fabulous Palm Springs Follies. Oh, get you're up. You're part of the Follies. Yes, you know about. Now our that's great a Follies. big deal out here. It, it is the biggest. Are you a local? I am now. Yes, we moved from. Here from Cleveland, Ohio. Oh my gosh, so you were a snowbird originally. I was indeed. And now you're here full time. I am working at the Follies and loving it. It's a wonderful show. All of your listeners should come and see it. We, see, I knew we'd get a plug in for that. Nice to meet you, your name Thank is? Thank you, I'm Lou Goldner. Yeah, 
Uh, usher is Lewis. My You're, wife and I are both ushers. At, where's at your wife? Does she have a get up like this? She too? does indeed. You missed her. She went up ahead of me. <laughs> All right. We'll see but you anyhow, at the Follies. I'm glad to see you. Nice to see you. And we, Louie, we got one more stop down here. I ran into these nice people here. These, this is the Silbar family. Hi, Jeff and I knew each other in Nashville we did. years we ago. Did. And you've got your whole family here for My the weekend. My wife, Lisa. Natalie, say hello. And Garrett, say hello. Hi, Garrett. And you were telling me that this is, how many years have you lived in California? About 16 years now. And what and were you telling me about? This is my second time here. And in 16 yeah. years. I, like you, think of the ocean when I think about California, but you forget about the desert is just amazing. Such a departure from where we grew up. Yeah, we were talking earlier that when we grew up in Tennessee, when I thought of California, I thought of the beach. I thought of all those uh, Gidget movies, that Annette Funicello movies. I didn't ever think of the desert. That's true. But this is uh, on your second and trip. What do you think about this? Well, this uh, doesn't look like any Indian reservation I've ever been to, but... Uh, the the weather at springtime here in the desert is about as beautiful as it can possibly be. And you're taking the whole family this morning to the living desert, which I understand is uh, like a reserve or for the. I'm not. I'm they not have sure. plants and animals. It's out in Palm Desert. It's absolutely yeah. wonderful. That's our next stop. Well, we've come a long way from Nashville. We have. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm to run into you. <laughs> yeah, with surprise. You, you never surprise. know who you're going to meet out here on the corner of the street on this Saturday morning drinking Palm your coffee. Spring. So you're doing Palm Spring Week, what is Palm it? Palm Springs Week. Oh, I see. Actually, we're doing two weeks of, right. of salute to Palm Springs. All right. So uh, it's kind of an annual trek and an excuse mm -hmm. for us to get away and come out here and spend uh, springtime in the desert. Well. Thanks for uh, interviewing us. <laughs> well, good to I'll see you. See you, later. you got nice a great to see job. you. <laughs> Bye, kids. Bye. Bye. And that's the way it is. We're out here on the corner of Palm Canyon Drive and Tokwitz Canyon Way on a beautiful Saturday morning here in Palm Springs in the Coachella Valley. Uh, and we'd like to invite you to continue having fun with us as Palm Springs Week continues every night at 7.30, right here on KCET. Now it's back to our coffee. We're having a wonderful morning, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> Intimate accommodations capture old world charm with a Spanish hacienda design and desert decor at La Quinta Resort and Club. The Diamond of the Desert offers championship golf on five resort courses. Spa La Quinta offers you serenity as you experience treatment under the desert sky. La Quinta Resort and Club is proud to be a sponsor of Hewell Hauser's look at the Palm Springs area.